Good evening and welcome to Tisky Sour. We have a very dramatic show for you tonight because Keir Starmer is trying to stitch up the Labour Party forever. He wants to lock out the left. Can he be stopped? I'll be speaking to a member of Labour's National Executive Committee. I'm also joined throughout the show by Dahlia. Gabriel, Dahlia, how are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you, Michael. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. I feel like this is sort mm-hmm. of like the bread and butter of, of Navarra Media, reporting on attempted stitch-ups within, within the Labour Party, a battle between left and right, although quite one-sided at this point in time. We'll also be speaking about some good news on climate change for a change um, and the direct action group Insulate Britain. You know the score. We do like to hear your comments and your questions. If you have any, tweet them on the hashtag Tisky Sour or put them in the comments under the video. First story. At Labour Party conference next week, Keir Starmer wants to push through three big reforms to cement his control. They include reducing the number of policy motions debated at conference, making it harder to trigger a selection process to replace a sitting Labour MP, and bringing back an electoral college system to select the party leader. This final proposed rule change is the most controversial. The current rules for leadership elections give every member of the Labour Party an equal vote. In the proposed electoral college, members would only have one third of the vote, with another third each going to MPs and trade unions. If passed, it would mean that 200 or so MPs would have the same influence as hundreds of thousands of members. On the BBC yesterday, Blairite MP Ben Bradshaw defended the move. What I think here is trying to do, and I haven't seen the detail, I'm not privy to the detail, is to ensure that the Labour Party under his leadership is a party that looks out to the country, out to the public, and is not constantly inward looking and involved in faction fighting. The current system hasn't worked. It makes sense in my view. MPs know the candidates well. They work with them over years. They know their strengths. They know their weaknesses. Their, their weaknesses. To return to the tripartite foundations on which our party was founded, mm. trade union members whose influence would increase under these proposals, as I understand it, to a third. They, they, they represented less than 20% of the votes in the last three leadership uh, uh, contests. So it would increase the influence of ordinary uh, levy-paying trade union members, a third to MPs and a third to members. I think that makes sense. That was Ben Bradshaw's take. John McDonnell was less impressed. My constituents and the people right the way across the country are facing a really tough winter, you know. Universal credit is going to be cut in a few weeks' time. Price rises going up, energy prices going up, wage freezes taking place, inflation increasing. That's what we should be concentrating on. And to be seen by the people of this country then to go into our conference, first time we're really meeting together physically for such a long time. And what are we doing? We're arguing about the rules of the Labour Party, the constitution of the Labour Party. It's a complete distraction. It isn't a good image. What we should be doing now is if he wants to change the rules, he should just have, like other Labour leaders, have a proper consultation, allow constituency parties to meet and the trade unions, take time over and bring forward proposals. You know, he was only elected 18 months ago as the leader on a one-member, one-vote system. He never said during that election he wanted to change the rules. So he's opening himself also open to charges of dishonesty in that respect. That was John McDonnell making a charge of dishonesty against Keir Starmer, which is pretty easy to make. Starmer gave no inkling in his leadership campaign that he would change the rules for future elections. And as Simon Fletcher, who worked on Starmer's leadership campaign, has pointed out, he didn't do that because if he had done, he would have lost. So will the dishonest proposals pass? We've shown you two takes from MPs, but it's not MPs, it's not the PLP who will decide whether or not this goes through. It will be the NEC who this Friday will vote on whether they will recommend these rule changes to conference and then it will be conference itself. People will vote on the conference floor as to whether or not these rule changes will be passed. For a preview of the NEC meeting this Friday, so that key meeting, I'm joined now by Lara McNeil, the youth representative on Labour's National Executive committee and we'll go into the the horse trading in in a moment first of all i want to know your personal opinion um, on on these changes which are being proposed 
Um, I, I think John McDonald said it excellently, to be honest. Um, it, he's exactly right. Um, I disagree entirely with the proposal that's being set out. Um, and there's many reasons for this. Obviously, um, we shouldn't be focusing on this time of changing things like the internal um, election of the leader and the process behind that. Keir hasn't been in a leader that long. And as you say, as I said previously, you know, he was elected on a one man, one vote and he didn't say that at the time that he was going to do that. But more importantly, because often the left, you know, get compared to the right and people say, well, you focus on internal battles too. Well, the reasons we often focus as the left on in internal things is, you know, what's the means to the end? Is it making sure that members are, you know, involved in society and active and want to be involved with the party? Or is it what's happening now, which is where we're seeing members leaving the party, people becoming demoralised, our finances are awful, things like that. So, you know, it's very funny when you see people like Ben Bradshaw saying, it's not, it's not factional, you know, it's, it's about increasing the rights of trade unions. It's just pure spin. Um, and, you know, I hope that members and society can see right through it. Um, but yeah, it, these internal battles are a distraction from what we should be doing, which is, you know, setting out policies that are going to get us elected to government and, you know, distribute wealth and power to the majority of people in society. Um, and the only time that the left should be focusing on internal battles is when it's you know, going to stop that happening. And in this instance, for example, the reason why we should care and we should be against it is because it's going to lead to, you know, unrepresentative um, party leader, which is going to represent, you know, the PLP, which are not rep more representative of society than the members. Um, so that's why we should fight against it, because it's intrinsically linked to the kind of party we want to be and the kind of people we want to represent. Mm, I, I think that final point's important. You know, people often say, you know, the organised left is made up of people who are a bit weird, a bit odd. We are a bit weird and we are a bit odd, but MPs, even weirder, trust me. <laughs> um, Lara, I want to move into the, the horse trading part of this. You'll be at the NEC meeting on Friday. Um, lots of different elements of the party represented on the NEC. You've got members, representatives, you're representative of, of the youth wing of the party. You've also got MPs and trade unionists. W what's your understanding of the, the chances that these, these rule changes will be passed by the NEC and therefore recommended to conference next week? So, yeah, it's interesting you say that MPs aren't making a decision, the NEC is. It's, it's important to remember how overrepresented MPs already are on the NEC. And that's like a big block, you know, including the leader and deputy leader and then, you know, shadow cabinet reps and PLP reps. So, yeah, that's important to, to remember. Um, I think in terms of the members reps of the NEC, I think it's very clear that most of them would be against it. And then obviously it comes down to the unions. Now, when you asked me to come on this, I was like, you know, I don't actually have that much information. I probably have about as much information as you're reading online because obviously I've got a perspective, but... We're just seeing this come online, you know, it's not been discussed with us, it's quite unprecedented how big a change this is, with hardly any time to discuss it, and there's a reason that Keir's going to the trade unions, is because they hold the balance of the power in that way. Um, but from what I can m make out online, um, the unions are worried about this, and I don't think that they are buying the fact that it's, just, you know, it's going to increase trade union representation and things like that, because it's not as simple as that, like, we haven't seen that throughout the party and throughout the changes that Keir's made in the last 18 months. Um, and we haven't seen that in terms of bold policy on things that the, the unions would support. So thankfully, I think that people are asking more questions. They take it very seriously. Um, it would take, you know, unions like Unison and the GMB to support this proposal for it to pass. And if it passes, then it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to pass on the conference floor or mind which is another key thing. So I think people need to keep making the arguments. And if it does pass the NEC, we need to be prepared to fight it on the conference floor. Um, but for now, it's all going to be up to the unions deciding whether this is something that's been, you know, slid in at the last minute in a factional way. And then they're using, you know, the words of the trade union movement, trying to like buy votes essentially, when actually it's showing dishonesty. And does that mean that, any promises made to the unions will actually not turn out in the end. So really, it's not really my decision. I know how I'll be voting. Um, it'll be up to the unions and um, yeah, we'll see. But as I say, if it passes NEC, it's not the end of the world. 
and we need to fight it on the conference floor to stop it happening. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting you say why would, you know, clearly the Keir Starmer is trying to make deals with these people, but why would you trust Keir Starmer when it comes to deals? Because he seems to break all of them. We've talked about the 10 pledges before. He agreed with Len McCluskey to let Corbyn back in the party, and we, we know how that went. Um, I want to talk about the trade unions in more detail. Um, some of the unions have been a little bit cagey, um, GMB, Unison, I don't think have really put their cards on the table at this point in time. Obviously, the unions matter, as you say. 13 of the 39 seats on the NEC are made up of trade unionists or representatives of the trade unions. Presumably, most people on the NEC should be trade unionists. And trade unions have 50% of votes on the conference floor. The other 50% is reserved for party members. Of the big unions, Unite have said they'll be opposing the changes. This is their newly elected General Secretary, Sharon Graham. I really think this is a, an error, absolute error. Anybody listening to that, you know, one member, one vote, being spoken about at Labour, they'll probably reach for the remote and switch it off because why would anyone be interested? Uh, at this point in time, Labour needs to focus on what's happening to workers and communities. Now, we have a policy on one member, one vote, and we will discuss that policy with the delegation. But what I said in the letter, which I think is the most important paragraph, is why are we talking about rule changes in Labour in a crisis? Um, I would suggest they put those into the back pocket. If they want to talk about them, put them somewhere else for another time. What they should focus on, if I was them, for every single day of the conference, talking about the issues that are facing workers and communities and how they can affect change as Labour. Because if they don't do that, if they sort of think, well, we'll do that another time when we start getting rules sorted out, I come back to the point about crisis. People remember who is beside you and people will remember that on this conference, Labour spoke about rules rather than issues. Um, and I think that's a huge error for them. That was Unite's Sharon Graham, the very impressive newly elected General Secretary of one of Britain's largest trade unions. Today, there was also a key meeting between Keir Starmer and all of the trade um, union leaders or their, or their representatives. Reports suggest that Unite, Unison and Usdor all said they felt blindsided by the proposals. So if they were to block the, the proposals, those three big unions, that would be enough to scupper them. However, according to The Guardian, all were willing to consider changing the rules, but wanted more time. So this is it's kind of an ambiguous message we're getting. As, as far as I can understand from people I'm speaking to, there isn't much consensus. What we could take from that, Lara, is, you know, the unions at the moment have settled on a point, which is that w we would prefer to have been consulted when it, come, when it, came to, when it, when it comes to, to put, putting forward these new rules. Um, but they're being a bit cagey about whether or not they would ultimately support them. Is that your impression as well? Yes, I think my impression of the way that some unions work, which is an understandable thing, is you want to support the leadership and there's, you know, unions like the GMB that have supported the leadership under Jeremy and have supported the leadership under Clear. I think fundamentally the most important thing is, you know, in a lot of cases, unity in a united position. Um, and, you know, standing up things where you think they matter, but in, in general, just trying to focus on like like Sharon was saying like the policies and not necessarily all internal rules um but yeah it's re it's really quite hard to tell um where these unions will go Unison is a very changing union uh, obviously GMB's had a new general secretary but Unison's got obviously the labor link committee the general secretary and lots of other layers that are, are changing right now and it's it's you know the biggest union in the country now and represents a lot of public sector workers so it will be interesting how the politics of Unison develop over this time. Um, but I think the, the key point is they really need to think about what, you know, if they can trust Keir Starmer to actually deliver on the things that he's saying. And often at NEC we have good discussions, but I, I get the feeling that people have already made their mind up when they go into the room, which is why it's, it's always a bit frustrating for people like me, because, yeah, you read about stuff online, you kind of know how it's going to go. And you don't feel like you necessarily have... A very strong say um but we've seen like tssa um for example come out very strongly against these changes uh, and um i'm sure um the bakers union unite um as left fbu and things i think they will be very strongly critical of this so hopefully we'll have a strong voice in in the chulo group to raise these concerns and actually it's just too late to address some of them even if people aren't against the rule change 
itself it, you can't address all these concerns in like how many days to conference it's ridiculous but 100% agree with what Sharon Grain says it doesn't mean we have to always be scared of rule changes but like I said at the beginning it needs to be for a reason we need to be saying we want these rule changes to make our party more representative to make our party you know um a party that better represents the working class and and this is why we're changing our policy structures so we um you know have better policy that's more representative and blah, blah, blah. But what does this do? How are we actually going to explain this to a layperson why it's important? Like she says, people are going to turn the telly off and not want to watch anything to do with Keir Starmer, are they? And I mean, it is suspicious, yeah, sort of saying, I, I want to pass this really dramatic, really significant rule change in seven days. Um, I, I want to ask you uh, something which is very relevant to the vote, which will happen on the conference floor. As you say, if this if this passes the NEC and gets recommended to conference, then it will be about how many of the, the CLP delegates are opposed to the rules and how many of the trade union delegates are opposed to the rules. Now, one of your colleagues on the NEC, Mish Rahman, tweeted some fairly worrying info earlier in the week, which is, is very relevant to how that voting on the conference floor will go. So he tweeted... I have received a number of emails from CLP delegates to conference who have received suspension of membership notices today. Reasons for suspension will follow a week later, probably after conference. They have incurred travel costs and accommodation to add to poor mental state. I mean, this is, this is incredibly worrying. This is a, you know, there's a key vote on conference floor, which is going to, in a way, determine the future of the Labour Party. And now, according to an NEC member... It's the case that members are receiving letters of suspension when they're planning to go to conference and have their vote. You know, they've been elected by their CLPs to go to conference and they're not even being told why they're being suspended. Are you hearing similar stories, Lara? People getting in contact with you with, with, with sort of anecdotes or complaints like this? Um, I can't say they are, but Mish is a CLP rep, so he's he's got a broader membership base than me. So I haven't had, well, obviously we've had issues with young members with, Jess Barnard, but also some other young members have got, um, you know, NOIs and things that have been unfounded or like, you know, that's a notice of investigation, right? Yes. And um, I have been sent things where, you know, someone's basically said things about Keir Starm and they've got investigated and things like that. Not suspended mine. But yeah, Mish knows like a lot of people send stuff into the CLP reps that I don't always see. Um, and yes, I, I know it has been happening and um, it's bad. And I think that we had a reassurance in the last NEC that David Evans was going to crack down on this kind of thing. And there was agency staff being brought in um, who weren't signing things off properly and just worrying stuff like that, which I feel like there have been massive um, improvements to the disciplinary system. And now it's just kind of falling apart again. And I think it's a mix of well, I think it's mainly like the buck stops with David Evans, doesn't it? And um, I think the the management of it and also the way that it's communicated to the membership is really bad. I think that it being, it's being used for factional means, but also I think that if he actually communicated better and was more transparent with what was happening, people would have more confidence in it. One of the reasons the disciplinary system is falling apart is because no one has any confidence in it. Um, and I fully accept that. So I can see these are all the good things, but it doesn't really matter, does it? Because people feel like they're being attacked. Like, you know, when Jess got her notice of investigation, you know, we've been told it's just a coincidence. Well, I, I don't buy that. And even so, people have to accept that she felt like that was an attack on her. And if people have a view that it's, you know, factional, it doesn't work, because why would you report into a system like that? Mm. Um, I suppose the, the worry here as well is that even if, even if these these investigations do get rescinded, it might be too late. You know, if the if the vote has already passed at conference, then you can't retrospectively give give someone a vote, can you? Um, you know, if they say in, yeah. in two weeks' time, they say, "Oh, actually, it was all it was a bureaucratic administrative mistake. We hit the yeah. suspend button by accident." Then that the votes already happened, and the the stitch up is already in. I don't understand how this has happened though. As well, if like there's already outstanding complaints against someone and they become a conference delegate, like people have been elected as conference delegates for ages, so surely they should have had like they would be able to tell. It should flag up on the system if they've got outstanding complaints. Anyway, I think if people are having issues with that and you're a delegate to conference, then 100% contact NEC members and we'll try and um, flag it to the governance legal unit and see if they can fast track, you know, so if it is unfounded, it gets resolved. But if it is justified, it justifies ascension, then at least that's clarified. 
Lara, thank you so much for your time this evening. I know you're incredibly busy. Junior doctor and youth NEC rep, one of the busiest people I know. Um, you'll have to keep us posted as to how that meeting goes on Friday. I'm sure I will put something on my Twitter, so yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. I, 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 I wanted an exclusive list. first, but fine, I'll just check your Twitter feed. Okay, I'll, I'll text you, Michael. <laughs> okay, speak soon. Um, let's go to a couple of comments. Shalendra Singh with a fiver, thank you very much. If that overgelled, treacherous snake oil salesman, aka Keir, thinks that his authoritarian clampdown will work, he is extraordinarily dim and deluded. Um, I'm glad you said it, not me. And Tad Cantwell with 10 euros. Where does this push for PR voting in the UK and a free vote for Labour candidates in the constituency stand for conference? Um, the free vote for Labour candidates, which I presume is sort of like an open selection thing, I would be very surprised if anything like that got to the conference floor um, because we know the top bureaucrats do not want people voting on that. PR, I know there is a big push for for PR to be sort of like a policy motion, I suppose. I have to admit, I've got no idea if that will get to the conference floor. My, my guess is that Keir Starmer doesn't want to be committed to anything on the basis that members want it. So they're going to try and um, make, make anything passed at conferences sort of vague and, and non-committal as possible. Um, let's talk a bit more about the fallout from these proposed rule changes. Um, before that, hit the like button if you're enjoying the show. These surprise rule changes, which have been sprung on the party at the very last minute, have generated a lot of heated debate. Most backbench Labour MPs have tweeted against the reforms, as have at least two shadow ministers. Rachel Maskell is shadow minister for the voluntary sector and charities. She tweeted the following. As a Labour MP, I should have a no greater say in leadership elections than other UK Labour members. The members are ultimately the party and they should equally elect their leader. OMOV, so one member, one vote, is the most democratic system. Let's respect our members. Let's respect party democracy. Sam Tarry, who's a shadow transport minister, had a very similar message. Um, no one so far from the shadow cabinet has sort of tweeted about this, but there was a quote in a... Um, article by Owen Jones today, which suggested that Andy McDonnell, who is the Secretary of State for Employment Rights, is opposed to the changes. The usual suspects, however, have come to the defence of Sir Keir. Um, I'm not sure if we can get up a tweet from Sonia Soda. No, we can't. I'll give you the, the, the general impression of what she said. So she's saying, in a parliamentary system, it's politically sensible and more democratically optimal for MPs to have an important say in choosing the leader of their party. They are much more in touch with the electorate than party members. Um, that has rightly, um, I mean, caused a lot of people to, to scoff at what Sonia Soda there is saying. MPs might be a lot of things. In touch with the general electorate, they aren't especially. Um, for examples of that, you could see how many Labour MPs were vociferously pushing for a people's vote when their constituents had absolutely no interest in one and, in fact, were quite offended at the prospect of having one. Um, it's also worth noting, as the journalist John Stone mentioned, that MPs are most notable for spending vast amounts of their time socialising with, talking to and listening to other MPs. They spend most of the week at Westminster speaking to another bunch of self-important and I think fairly out of touch, um, people in the halls of the House of Commons and much less speaking to ordinary people in the street. Labour members, on the other hand, these are hundreds of thousands of people working in <laughs> public sector jobs, you know, speaking to a huge variety of people every day. So I would say they are probably a little bit more representative than the 200 MPs that Labour sends to Parliament. For a very clear example of um, how out of touch with popular opinion these people are. Um, I think we'll go to a tweet from Gabriel Pogrand. Um, so the briefing they've been giving to the press are just ridiculous. We might not be able to get this up. Um, so uh, two key Starmer allies, we have got it up, who are philosophical about early union opposition to electoral college. Even if it doesn't pass, coming close would demonstrate to the public that everything that went wrong in 2015 is over. Question is whether Leader himself is spooked. Now, why I say this demonstrates how out of touch they are is the public don't care. This idea, even if Keir Starmer loses narrowly and we maintain a one member, one vote system for electing the Labour leader, that will 
impress the public because at least he took the left on. Now, this idea that anyone, anyone cares about this other than, I mean, primarily people on the Labour right who sort of are obsessed with destroying the left is just completely, completely laughable. No, have you ever spoken to anyone who's not a Labour Party member who says, oh, the reason I'm not voting for the Labour Party is because of the, the particular rules you have in your leadership election or because your, your leader was never willing to even try and change them. They're, they're thinking that Keir Starmer is going to be rewarded for trying to change the rules for the leadership election and failing. It's, it's completely bizarre. What I do want to show you, though, is what these MPs do have on their side because they might be out of touch with the general public. They are very much in touch um, with the mainstream media and we are really seeing this when it comes to reporting of well, the purges we're seeing and this 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 attempt to railroad through rule changes without any consultation the the most sort of apt example of this i think is from rachel wim of she is a political journalist at the mirror in response to that mish Rahman tweet that we showed you before so with that news um, that conference delegates were being suspended without being told why, getting their letters after conference happened, she tweeted, Labour in full-on internecine -nee mode. Labour in full-on internecine -nee mode. Now, that's a funny way to describe people being suspended for no reason before a conference. Uh, a more reasonable, a more common way to talk about that would be to say a purge. Right? A purge. Now you might say, oh, look, she's, she's a political journalist who wants to sound really, really neutral. She doesn't want to use the kind of loaded languages of, or the, the loaded words such as purge, because that, that, you know, that sounds too emotional. Well, this is how we have covered Labour Party fights in December 2015, when Corbyn was in charge. Deputy Chief Whip Alan Campbell MP to be demoted by Corbyn as part of a purge of moderates in the new year, according to reports. Let's go to June 2017. Jeremy Corbyn allies planned purge of Labour HQ in bid to stamp his authority on party. Now let's go to 2018. Scottish Labour reshuffle dubbed purge of the moderates. And now we can go again. This is from October 2018. Given Sawa learned he was sacked while leading a debate on health and Dugdale being left to foot her own bills in the Wings case, this is looking like a symbolic purge of the moderates in Scottish Labour. So these are nearly all examples of shadow ministers being demoted. It's a completely ordinary thing that happens all the time in political parties. Party leaders are allowed to demote people on their front bench. This was a purge because Corbyn was doing it. Now we have the classic example of a purge, which is bureaucrats in a party are kicking people out for political reasons without giving them any good reason why. And suddenly this is just inter sign war. This is just, oh, two sides battling. Who's to say who's right and who's wrong and who's the aggressor and who's the person subject to aggression? Um, Dahlia, I want your thoughts on this. I suppose a couple of things to say, which is, you know, uh, do these people realise what they're doing? Do, do they realise how inconsistent they're being? And then also, I've heard some people say Corbyn should have done this. Corbyn should have been tough like Keir Starmer has been. But I do think that potentially ignores the fact that if Jeremy Corbyn had tried any of this, he would be being dragged through the mud by the media, like left, right and centre. Maybe you should have taken that flak, but it would be a completely different situation to the one we're in now where, where Starmer is trying to do it. Well, I don't know about you, Michael, but, you know, when I was trudging through the, the rain in Newcastle under Lyme, all I heard on the doorstep was one member, one vote. Can't believe Labour is, you know, is, is, is running their system on what it should be an electoral system. And, you know, for that reason, I'm going to vote to continue to decimate the NHS and make it impossible for my kids to ever um, own a house. I mean, this is obviously, firstly, like to address like Sonia Sodha's tweet. When I saw that tweet, I was just like, have you like been outside recently? Like if you if you think that MPs actually represent that necessarily represent their constituency in this country. The entire political system is designed so that people are given, you know, MP status in particular constituencies, particularly secure things that are seen as safe constituencies, as political favours. Like I have Kate Hoey is a perfect example of this. She is, you know, a very, very strong Brexiteer, uh, appeared on the campaign trail with Nigel Farage. Meanwhile, she was the MP for Vauxhall, which is estimated to be 50% black and minority ethnic. Many, many, many of those are Europeans um, and also voted 77% to remain in the EU. Um, and 
the 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 irony as well of that is that when you actually look at how Kate Hoey became MP of Vauxhall, there's a lot of echo between what happened in that case and what ha- what is happening right now. Um, you know, I, for those who don't know the story, uh, Martha Osimor, who's Kate Osimor's mother. Uh, was actually had the support of the local party and had, you know, done everything that she needs to do in order to be, you know, the Labour candidate for Vauxhall and the NEC as part of a crackdown on the Labour black sections, which was, you know, radical black uh, members of the Labour Party, Diane Abbott, Bernie Grant. These were all people who came up through those ranks. And the NEC was basically on a warpath with at that time, what was the insurrectionary left uh, force within the Labour Party, um, largely where a lot of the socialist energy was coming from. And the NEC uh, blocked Martha Osimor and forcibly implemented Kate Hoey. And we all see how that works out. You end up with these incredibly out of touch MPs who actually in, in, in end up literally campaigning against the position of the party 30 years later. So the way that you know the party has historically treated this is the way the party has historically treated radical and socialist and insurrectionary forces within the party um and i think that in terms of you know should corbyn have done this um you know of course it would have been absolutely slammed in the press. I mean, he every time he tried to reshuffle his shadow cabinet, he was accused of doing a purge. Every time he, you know, looked sideways at, you know, Tom Watson, he was accused of doing a purge. So you would have absolutely been dragged in the press, but it could have been done in a way that makes that opposition to what you're doing look like it is you know fighting for the establishment fighting for anti-democratic values which is what they are fighting for so for example if you said right we're going to do you know let's say something like reselections right which was you know the big fight that happened um within within the labor party which was you know which obviously corbyn never pursued if you had you know said right we are only fielding local candidates we're fed up of having you know candidates that have no connection to the community being parachuted in that's something that is very very popular everyone hates the fact that you know mp positions are passed around like party like party favors essentially um i think that's a big reason why we lost the red wall because many of those seats were seen as so safe that they could be given away to people as you know bargaining chips and in order to call in favors further down the line um, and it, it meant that, you know, the Labour Party became synonymous with, you know, corruption and neglect in, in a lot of these um, seats. And then, you know, the, the second referendum position was the kind of final nail in the coffin there. So if you had made this an issue about, you know, local democracy, local community, uh, you know, not having this kind of corrupt system that so we know is so deeply unpopular with MPs that have no connection to their community being forced on these very communities, then you would have still gotten all of the flack, you would have still gotten dragged, you would have gotten smeared, but you would have had a stronger counter narrative that would have, if not necessarily, you know, managed to seep through those headlines and seep through that media noise, it would have at least made, created a little bit of ambivalence around it. Whereas when you try to play nicey nice and you try to say, I'm going to be soft, I'm going to be small, I'm going to try and sort of not do anything to, to trigger this machine that exists precisely to make sure that people like me never get anywhere near power. Um, then what you end up doing is you end up getting dragged anyway, but you look weak while you're get while you're being dragged. And then not only do you sort of lose the immediate battle, but you also lose the long term battle because your legacy goes down um, as a kind of weakness, and that those who dragged you had a reason to, and you know were were right to because you, your voice didn't come didn't come through in that. And you know I think that this was always part always needed to be part of a longer term kind of strategy where you know you don't undo decades of neoliberal centrism with just one you know even if jeremy corbyn did win um the the gov you know did become prime minister you can't undo all of that in just one term in office but what you could have done is 
built a sustainable legacy of a PLP that actually reflects the concerns of voters, reflects the concerns of members, has the buy-in of the membership, who are the people that go out and create the, the kind of like the campaign that, that means that you have any chance of winning in a society where the conservatives hold all of the media power. And so, yes, you know, even if Corbyn had won, he would have, I think, would have eventually fallen under the weight of the forces against him, but at least either before or after the election. But he could have left behind something more resilient than what we started with. And that would have been something like a, a, a Labour Party whose makeup more accurately reflects um, the people who vote for the Labour Party. And let's not forget that's the strategy that Keir Starmer is employing. It's very, very clear. And, you know, the Sharon Graham, Laura McNeil, for the reasons that they've outlined, very clear that at the moment, he's not there to like win over people to Labour. He's not there to like win, you know, in win sort of like the polls because, you know, he's focusing on things that people don't care about. And I don't think he doesn't understand that. What he's there to do is to systematically change the Labour Party so that there is to block every future pathway for power um, for the left in this period. And so they sort of have the right and the centre have that sort of medium to long term vision of what work they're trying to do, regardless of the flack it might incur in the short term. Um, and I think that maybe things would have been better if, if we would kind of had a similar a similar tack. Mm, I mean... Yeah, it would have been nicer to have a more resilient institution when it comes to the Labour Party. Speaking of resilient institutions that give the left a fair treatment, Navarro Media relies on your kind support. We are forever grateful for our regular donors that make all of this possible. If you are not already one, please do go to navarromedia.com forward slash support. We ask for the equivalent of one hour's wage a month. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel as well. Keir Starmer's attempt to bring back the Electoral College for leadership election puts a number of Labour MPs in an awkward position. That's because in 2014, most Labour MPs backed the abolition of the Electoral College, which gives MPs, trade unionists and party members a third each of votes in any leadership election. And most MPs supported the move to replace it with one member, one vote. Now, in order to defend Keir Starmer's decision to bring back that electoral college, these MPs are being forced into dramatic U-turns. And the person for whom this is most embarrassing is surely Ed Miliband. Ed was in charge of the party in 2014 when the electoral college was abolished. And back then, this is how he justified the move. By voting for these reforms, though, you're not just voting to open our doors and reach new people. You're voting for the biggest transfer of power to our members and supporters in the history of the Labour Party. Because, because still today, because still today, after all of those changes, the vote of a member of parliament is worth a thousand times more than the vote of a Labour Party member. It's time to make ourselves a party of equality. Ed Miliband there was very eloquently implying that the old electoral college system meant the Labour Party was not truly a party of equality. It was only with reform that they could consider themselves you know, such a worthy title. Surely that would mean he'd have to oppose any move to bring back an electoral college. Not so. Ed Miliband is now in Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet, and this is how he fielded a question on Starmer's rule changes earlier today. In 2014, you said you wanted to change these rules to make sure that the Labour Party was more in touch with ordinary voters. Would you agree that actually a change in the rules back to how they were before does not keep the Labour Party in touch with ordinary workers? Well, well no. Look, Keir Starmer's intention, as he said very clearly in his proposals, is to get the Labour Party uh, in touch with, with voters. And I, and, I think, and I think that's the key thing, is that he wants the Labour Party focusing on the country. I know that in his conference speech and in the proposals we're going to make at our conference, we're going to be focusing on all of these issues, including the ones we've been discussing today, that so many people are facing up and down the country, the cost of living crisis, how we recover from the pandemic, how, how we tackle the climate emergency, which is another part of what I'm uh, focused on. So look, it's absolutely, he is right, his prerogative, and I support him in doing it. 
uh, to come forward with uh, proposals. And as I say, we're a democratic party and the party will uh, take its view on it. Poor Ed Miliband. I mean, he's always seemed like a, a nice guy. He's got some interesting ideas when it comes to politics and policy. His downfall was always that he couldn't stand up to the Labour right. That was his big problem when he was leader of the party. And it seems to still be the case. You know, you can't say Keir Starmer is implementing these because he wants to be in touch with ordinary workers and the electorate of this country. Well, why then did you support something, and not even support, you, you pushed through something completely different in 2014. Do you think that when you pushed through those rules in 2014, you were taking Labour further away from ordinary voters? If you do, you should probably admit that. You should say, oh, I made a terrible mistake. But you can't not say that and then now say, oh, Keir Starmer is doing this for X, Y, Z rule because he just wants the Labour Party to face outwards. We all know, you know, Ed Miliband knows that the reason these rules are being changed is because they don't want a left winger to get elected again. They didn't think that it was that this system was going to elect a left winger in, in 2015. Their idea actually was that by introducing one member, one vote, you should drown out all the radical leftists with ordinary people. You, you could not possibly have 400,000 people vote for a candidate of the hard left. So they thought the more people we get voting for this, the more moderate they're going to be. They were dramatically wrong. It turns out that actually it's very difficult to get, you know, even 100,000 people to vote for a, a generic moderate. It's why Keir Starmer had to pretend to actually be quite left wing. And now they want to change the rules back. It's got nothing to do whatsoever with speaking to ordinary voters, with speaking to ordinary workers. Ed Miliband knows it and he should admit it. Dahlia, will he? You think Ed Miliband will admit it? I, I'm, not, I'm not holding my breath. Yeah, I mean, I think that ultimately Ed Miliband is scared. He he has seen the way that the Labour Party at the moment is absolutely ruthless. He's seen the treatment of Rebecca Long Bailey. He's seen the treatment of Jeremy Corbyn. He's thinking, I don't want to go there. And that's what's so powerful about this culture that Keir Starmer has created is that he actually doesn't even need to discipline people anymore. People discipline themselves because the party has become so, author I mean, the word, I, the only word I can think of is authoritarian and controlling, um, that there is literally that fear that, you know, you will be chucked out of the, the position that you're in, which I think is what Ed Miliband is probably nervous about. And I think that his use of the climate crisis there um, to sort of as is, you know, to, to gesture to, you know, this is so that we can uh, get on with with doing things like fighting the climate crisis. It's this very culture of control, of extreme control and dismissiveness of the membership um, that, met, that led to Labour for a Green New Deal's motion being denied, even being debated in conference. And that's after you have, you know, that, that motion being passed by 25 local parties, being backed by, by unions like the fire brigade unions, uh, also backed by MPs. And, you know, for no good reason, it was now it has been, you know, after they were appealed, it's now going to be debated on conference floor. But does that give, is that the impression of a party that is so invested in elevating party democracy so they can do things like fight climate breakdown? Doesn't look like that to me. We've got some good comments. Henry the Ape fake. Oh, Ed, fumbling the bag again. I want to like the guy, but he keeps making completely unforced errors. I mean, in a way, he's, this isn't so much an unforced error because there's clear pressure for him to fall in line. The issue is that he won't, you know, he, he won't do the difficult thing. You know, the difficult thing is standing up for what you believe in, and he does fold um, too easily, it seems, which is very related to the next comment, actually. This is from the Twitch chat. Spinwood says, surely we're not surprised that the leader responsible for the Edstone has flexible principles. Um, very well put. Remember, you can let us know your comments by tweeting on the hashtag Tisky Sour. Next story, completely unrelated. More important from a world historical perspective. It's rare to be able to deliver good news on climate change, but this Tuesday, an announcement was made which could seriously dent global carbon emissions in the coming years. Speaking at the UN, China's President Xi Jinping committed to the immediate end of all funding for overseas coal power plants. This is a very big deal, as when it comes to providing international finance for coal power, China is in a league of its own. You can see here far and away, the biggest funders of overseas coal. Once they pause that funding, it will become much harder for governments in developing countries to get loans 
to fund coal power generation. There is a catch. China is, as yet, not making any commitment when it comes to domestic coal power. So how seriously should we take this pledge? To find out, I spoke earlier today to Sam Giel, CEO at China Dialogue and an expert on environmental policy in China. It's genuinely encouraging. Of course, we need to go much further. There's lots that uh, you know, I'm hoping we'll, we'll see sort of play out over the next few months. But, uh, but it, it really means a lot, especially because this now really means there are no international financiers of, of coal. China haven't committed to stop building coal plants within China. And I, I, I think that's, there's more emissions that come from power plants within China than the ones they fund internationally. So wouldn't that be the, the bigger deal? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, you know, China accounts for half of the world's um, existing coal fleet at this point, and they need to go further in terms of curbing their own um, you know, brown economy, their, their uh, coal-fired power. This pledge comes uh, at, you know, a year to the day after China's 2060 pledge. Uh, Xi Jinping unilaterally last year pledged to uh, reach carbon neutrality um, uh, by 2060 to peak emissions by 2030 at, at latest, um, and there's every hope that it could come in earlier. Um, and in the 14 five-year plan that, was, uh, that, that started this year, there's a plan for you know, how they can, uh, they, they, they can increase the uh, carbon intensity, or they, they can reduce the carbon intensity of the economy, uh, increase the efficiency of the economy, that is to say the um, reducing carbon emissions per unit of economic output. It doesn't go far enough in terms of putting an absolute cap on coal, and I think there'll be further pressure to, um, uh, you know, to 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 get there. Um, you know, there's a push and pull uh, as anywhere else between sort of vested interests between local and central governments, um, you know, between a, a coal lobby and uh, renewables energy industry. But I think this sends a pretty important signal, both globally and to you know China's own industries, that that you know the writing is on the wall for coal, and that the economics point strongly in favour of of renewables and of you know the, the technologies that I think China broadly is sort of taking a gamble on in terms of, of what they believe the future is going to look like. This is really a signal about China positioning itself as the leading exporter of the technologies of the future that are needed for a carbon constrained world um, and really sort of riding the kind of economic wave that's coming about through waves of technological innovation around renewables. A lot of the falling cost of renewables really is owed to the scale of production in China, um, you know, big state-owned firms and and private firms kind of competing um, and bringing down the, the the cost very effectively and very fast over the last decade or so, and it's one of the things that underlies a lot of the uh, diplomatic progress that's been made. Um, so I think this is an important signal to developing countries who might still look at coal as being cheap, as being a you know a, an important kind of aspect of their development path, to say, well, no, actually we. <laughs> you know, no, no longer really see this as a viable, appropriate kind of technology for um, uh, for development. Um, and, you know, that sends a signal really about China's intent as well, I hope. People will often, I think, rightly be cynical about all the attention that we, we hear about in you know the United States and UK and the West, which has historical responsibility for climate change, on what's China going to do. You know, China needs to commit to that. China needs to, to, to commit to this. From sort of following discourse in in China, what is Chinese civil society saying about what the West needs to do for COP26? What, what are their demands of, of us, as it were? I mean, China has a pretty active environmental civil society who uh, you know, engage with uh, Global South networks and, uh, and, and historically have been very critical or, or, or very sort of um, have offered like quite a robust critique of China's development model and really, I think, helped to push it towards one that has moved away from growth at all costs and has uh, moved away from kind of pollute first, uh, clean up later kind of approaches. Um, and I think would have a similar critique to many, including myself, of kind of the positioning of rich countries uh, as we go into COP26, which is to say, <laughs> demonstrating a really um, enormously insufficient kind of level of solidarity with the most vulnerable countries. You know, this applies also to to large emitters like China and India and so on as well. I don't think they can hide behind uh, the sort of the world's poor. Um, but you know, as far as um, as China's now going and kind of stepping up its ambition, 
we need to see a lot more from the rich countries, specifically climate finance, um, uh, you know, commitments on vaccines, on debt, on, on loss and damage, on the 1.5 degrees target. These are absolutely critical uh, questions for the world's poorest countries, which are also the, the most vulnerable. And, you know, frankly, at, at this point, you know, uh, countries like the, the, you know, the United States and the UK have no moral standing to, um, to push China anymore unless they can actually uh, sort of demonstrate um, that they're willing to go further on these critical issues. Um, because there's really, um, there, there's really no way that the, the, the kinds of um, uh, the political alignments that we will need in order to uh, in order to get to uh, a resolution can be made without, you know, the rich countries actually uh, sort of showing some some genuine commitment on on these issues. I mean, the, the um, 100 billion dollar target that was agreed at, at Paris uh, for um, uh, for, for climate finance to developing countries has never materialized. Um, we're starting to see some commitments on that yesterday from Biden, and I think that's really to be welcomed. Um, but, you know, th that, that kind of money really needs to be um, uh, shown at this point. And I think that will really help to move the politics. And it will also um, sort of help to move countries like China out of a more traditional negotiating stance where they can essentially say, well, look, the, the ball is in, in the rich countries' court because you know it is, um, and and uh, you know rich countries need to lead by example at this point. Need to demonstrate solidarity, and then I think we can kind of move forward um, and see China also really stepping up its ambition. Hopefully, which specifically means you know putting in greater commitments, greater ambition on their own domestic um, emissions, i.e., moving forward their their peak year from twenty thirty to twenty twenty five, for example. Uh, putting in a cap on on uh, on China's own carbon emissions, uh, maybe increasing the um, you know um, ambition of its own carbon intensity goals, things like that. I think are doable for China, which has a history of kind of under promising and, and over delivering on on its climate targets. Um, the United States, by contrast, you know doesn't. It has a it has a history of kind of coming into the uh, talks very um, very loudly and then of course the administration changing and, and Congress not being able to pass bills and not really being able to, um, uh, uh, to, to be good to its words. So there needs to be very serious kind of uh, work done uh, you know, in, in the United States and in the UK as hosts to really um, uh, sort of demonstrate bona fides. So you know, it's, 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 it's complex politics going in and we don't have long until, um, uh, until Glasgow. That was Sam Giel, CEO at China Dialogue and an expert on environmental policy in China. Let's go on to our final story for the evening. A new campaign group called Insulate Britain has blocked the M25 five times in the past two weeks. The protest group is calling for the installation of heat-saving measures in social housing by 2025 and all homes by 2030. It's an important demand. The heating of homes currently makes up 15% of Britain's carbon emissions, yet it doesn't get nearly as much attention as other polluting industries, such as air travel, which only makes up 7% of Britain's carbon footprint. Insulate Britain's disruptive actions have so far been successful at moving the issue up the media agenda. They have also unsurprisingly taken a lot of flack. This was activist Liam Norton facing off with journalist Dawn Neeson on Good Morning Britain. Why haven't you insulated your own home for a start? Because I think where you're coming from is, is pure hypocrisy as well. Sorry, is that the case? Is your home not insulated, Liam? Susanna, whether my... Um, Just answer the question, Liam. It's not, is it? We know it's not. And whether my, my, whether, my, whether my home is insulated or not doesn't change the fact that oh. millions of people's homes aren't insulated and they're not Sorry, going to be. Uh, is this the case? You're, you're saying you would risk your life, risk your life for Insulate Britain but you're not going to insulate your own home. Susanna, the thing is... Sorry okay, if I sound patronising, but that sounds no, no, like no, you're completely no, sabotaging your cause. The thing is, this question. is like a shame that this discussion has been ba like debased in this way, because what we're talking about is the future of, the, the, uh, of our country. Yes. Our country is going to be destroyed if we don't get home? in... If we don't get this sorted that out... start at home? Well, you know, insulation costs thousands, tens of thousands of pounds. You're aware of that. Okay, so you're saying you can't afford 
to insulate your home. No, what I'm saying is millions of people over so in you the can, country... So you can, not. Millions of people in the country cannot afford to do it. That's why millions of our people well, so are So you're in, not insulating your home as a protest? Do you think against, it's acceptable for millions of the people government. in our country to be living in fuel poverty, tens of thousands of them to be dying in their homes, freezing to death. Do you think that's acceptable? Look, Liam, I can't understand why you wouldn't start with insulating, start with insulating your own home. Whether that's true or not, do you think that's acceptable? Well, because that's true, what's Liam. going on. Right. Now, people have seen clips of that interview on, on Twitter, perhaps. It wasn't an amazing interview from the activist, but that's kind of besides the point. The other people on that panel were professional broadcasters and, and journalists. They're very used to having these kind of arguments. So I want to focus here on, on the substance of this. And the substance is that they were trying to catch that activist out on the basis that he hadn't insulated his own home. And why I think that's, I mean, ridiculous, actually. They're, they're basically calling him a hypocrite because he hasn't insulated his own home. Now, for him to be a hypocrite, insulate Britain, their demands would have to be for people to individually insulate their own homes. They'd have to be saying, we're blocking this road because we want everyone who's stuck in this traffic jam to go home and pay to insulate their homes. That's not their demand at all. Their demand is completely different. I want to go to, uh, this, this is from their website, in fact. I went to check today what, what they are calling for. Very explicit. We demand, one, that the UK government immediately promises to fully fund and take responsibility for the insulation of all social housing in Britain by 2025. And two, that the UK government immediately promises to produce within four months a legally binding national plan to fully fund and take responsibility for the full low energy and low carbon whole house retrofit with no externalised costs of all homes in Britain by 2030 as part of a just transition to full decarbonisation of all parts of society and the economy. Now, that second demand could have been a bit piffier, very long sentence, but a very reasonable demand and one which is in no way contradicted by someone not already having paid to insulate their home. It's a bit like saying, oh, does your electricity come from coal? Then you can't complain about new coal power plants. No, if, if you can't afford to insulate your home, then you still have every right to be demanding the government do it for you and for everyone else. In fact, you have more reason to be. Because one of the things with, with insulating homes and why it could be quite an interesting political demand is because it, it should save people in the long term in terms of um, bills, um, electricity bills. So if we have a movement where people are protesting the government to insulate their own homes, that would be amazing. It, it wouldn't be a demonstration of hypocrisy. That would actually be the beginning of a very effective political movement. Dahlia, I want to go to you on this. I'm sure you've been in that situation many a time where there are a broadcaster is trying to, to catch you out on some personal choice that you've made that's kind of besides the point as to what argument you're, you're actually making. Um, what's your general take on, on Insulate Britain and this, 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 this move to block the M25 to try and get insulation up the news agenda? I think there has to be a conversation uh, to be had on strategy in the climate movement, um, particularly in the UK, and not, not in a sense of, oh, we should be nicer, we should be less disruptive, and maybe the media will back off a bit. That, that's not at all what I mean. Uh, rather, I think that when, we, when things like direct actions are taking place, I think it's really important that that direct action communicates the politics that you're tr that of, of what you are doing and communicates the politics of the the world that you want to see and i you know i, I was thinking about uh i was walking past a, an extinction rebellion protest um in the center of london a few weeks ago it was not a few weeks ago uh less than that but i remember seeing sort of public buses being sort of blocked by the protest and then a few streets down there was like three range rovers and a jaguar that was like being like wasn't having any attention drawn to it. And I think that there's something to be said about when we are talking about direct action, we need to think about what are the infrastructures of climate breakdown. And those really are where the kind of, the points should be, the points of awareness, because that way the politics of what you're trying to do, which is to move this idea of, you know, fighting climate change away from the realm of the individual and everyday working class people at, at taking individual action and towards these ideas of what are the massive infrastructures, you know, the energy infrastructure, the food infrastructures, the political infrastructures, the media infrastructures that have brought us to the situation that we're in. 
Um, so, you know, I think that, that, you know, if you think about, for example, and I think that's especially important given the climate movement's history in the UK of being, having a very middle class reputation where you sort of have middle class people haranguing working class people for eating like non-organic food. Um, so I think given that we need to be a bit careful about the strategy and the targets and the kind of way that we're articulating the world that we actually want to see and the pathway out of climate breakdown um, that we want to see. But that's not the line of questioning that's happening in this interview right now. Um, and it's it's not only total bad faith, but it just demonstrates, like I said before, that broadcast media and tabloid media is actually part of the infrastructure of climate breakdown by employing, you know, I've said it before, that climate deflectionism is the new climate denialism, where instead of outright denying climate change as a problem, you just sort of pick apart and try and focus on and divert attention towards, oh, it's all China's fault. Oh, it's all India's fault. Oh, well, you know, do you uh, recycle everything? Do you drink your own piss? Like, do you know what I mean? So trying to kind of deflect from the original, from the actual causes of climate breakdown and the actual pathways out of climate breakdown and sort of just wasting precious time so that the powerful are left, un are left unaccountable. Um, but also, where is this energy from Susanna Reid um, and other journalists when it comes to, you know, Boris Johnson commissioning a new co coal mine, when it comes to the continued financing and insuring of fossil fuel companies for, by, you know, our city of London at the same time as the government is trying to kind of claim leadership on climate change. Where is it when it comes to the fact that agriculture companies that are headquartered in this country are being allowed to continue to destroy our ecosystem and exploit workers around the world. I don't see this energy coming from, you know, journalists and presenters. And, you know, as you pointed out, so, you know, as you pointed out there, um, this is not, there's nothing inconsistent about someone who believes that the government should take responsibility and insulate the homes of especially working class people in this country who did not cause the climate crisis there's no inconsistency between someone being part of that campaign and them not having sh shelled out tens of thousands of pounds to get their home insulated um but i think it's 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 not it's not necessarily unrelated but it's kind of a, a broader point that i think is so interesting which is that the right wing media, tabloid media, broadcast media have done such a good job over many decades to make this charge of hypocrisy like the greatest sin that you could possibly be accused of. Um, you know, being seen to be a hypocrite, i.e., you know, uh, not not wanting to actually promote good standards and promote, you know, good things, but not flawlessly being seen to uphold all the standards that you are trying to promote is seen as worse than actually just actively trying to make people's lives worse. So it's like this nifty little trick that they do to, to turn the public against and sort of generate anger against, you know, social movements and people who are actually trying to raise concerns about real issues when really they should be shining a light on those who are pushing climate breakdown with impunity. But it's almost like trying to do good and not being able to, you know, in their eyes, even you though, know, as I said, there's no inconsistency between this person's position in these person's positions, but more to be seen to not be fulfilling those standards in every minute of your life is actually seen as less corrupt and less as more corrupt and more heinous than actually just not caring about anyone to begin with. And I just think that's such an interesting strategy. And it always it means they always win, it means they always work on their favor and the conversation always happens on their terms. So I think we need to be really careful about that um, and sort of really identify what the work of that, ch that charge is actually doing. Mm. No, I mean, I, I think they're all really strong points. And I mean, there's some people in the comments saying it, 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 it wasn't the best interview. And I mean, you, you could have, I think, probably more effectively, you know, responded and saying, no, I haven't insulated my own home because I can't afford to, which is why I want the government to step in and do it. You can't expect me on whatever income I am to, to do this. I'm, I'm precisely the example of what's wrong with this system. You know, as I say, these people, activists do an important job, getting a, an important issue to the top of the news agenda. If they're, you know, not very practiced at, at broadcast journalism that's not that's not surprising so i tend to be you know quite quite sympathetic in these situations i've done bad interviews on on tv and i'm someone who does you know broadcast free free nights a week um on navarra media at 7 p.m 
Uh, let's go to a final comment. Nicola Curtin with five pounds. It is only direct action which is going to bring about change. I am fed up to the back teeth of hearing these silly arguments against direct action. Um, I think it's a very strong point. I and mean, I'm, I'm very into diversity of tactics, direct action, electoral politics, whichever floats your boat. Um, but I do think, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Extinction Rebellion, when it first came around, I was like, I'm not really sure if this is my kind of politics or movement. It was incredibly effective. You know, Extinction Rebellion shut down London for a few days and climate change massively moved up the political agenda. MPs declared a climate emergency. So I think all power to them and all power to these insulate Britain people because no one was talking about insulation on Good Morning Britain before they blocked the M25. I mean, it's just really difficult to, to argue against that. Um, Dahlia Gabriel, it's been an absolute pleasure being joined by you this Wednesday evening. It's been a pleasure to spend my Wednesday evening with you once again. <laughs> <laughs> it's becoming a bit of a routine, isn't it? For now, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and for your super chats and comments. We'll be back on Friday at 7 p.m. For now, you've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night.